Thank you. Call meeting to order, please. Supervisor Wells, will you leave us an invocation, please, sir? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we bless us as we gather today to, as friends and community members, bless our community of Frederick County. We're so fortunate to, to have what we have, and it's God-given. Thank you for all the police officers, firemen, service people that work so hard to meet the services that we request and demand. And Lord, guide and hold our hands and direct us in the way you would live your life to do the right things, to do a good deed each day, to follow the golden rule, to respect each other. Lord, we ask that you teach us and lead us in the right ways that we should operate our governments, state, local, and federal. We ask all of these blessings that you give us every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Law, can you lead us in the pledge, please? Sir? Stand and face your flag and join me at the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Adoption of the agenda. Are there any proposed changes? Uh, we have none, Mr. Chairman. Entertain a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Um, citizen comments, agenda items only that are not subject to public hearing. Did anyone sign up? No, sir. Thank you. Consent agenda. How would the board like to handle this one? Approval as submitted. Motion to approve as presented. Is there a second? Second. Second, is there any discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Consent agenda is adopted as presented. Board of Supervisors comments, are there any? Hearing none. County officials, committee appointments. Extension Leadership uh, Council, I believe that we're still looking for a Back Creek still representative. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Shawnee Land Sanitary District Advisory Committee. Or was Mr. Chairman, I'm still not ready to make that appointment. We will be discussing uh, this item in Public Works Committee next week. Okay. And then we're still looking for someone that's interested in serving on the Board of Equalization. So share that with anyone you know who might be interested. Uh, committee Business, the Finance Committee. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. The Finance Committee uh, met on January the 16th. Um, our agenda was rather short in light of the December agenda, <laughs> and um, I would make a motion that I, uh, items number one and two be approved on consent. Okay. Heard the motion to approve items <coughs> one and two. Second. Second. Any discussion? Supervisor McCarthy? Aye. Supervisor Slaughter? Aye. Supervisor Wells? Aye. Supervisor Lofton? Aye. Supervisor Dunn? Aye. Supervisor Trout? Aye. Chair votes aye, and the motion carries. Both finance committee items are approved. All right. Public hearings, non planning commission. There aren't any planning commission business. Public hearings, rezoning number 0318, Carpers Valley Industrial Park. Ms. Harkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. This is a request to rezone 122 acres from the R4 Residential Planned Community District with proffers to the M1 Light Industrial District with revised proffers. Now the subject property is part of the original Carpers Valley or Governor's Hill rezoning, which was approved in 2005, and there was also a number of revisions, the last one in 2014. Now the rezoning 11 of 05 provided for 143 acres of commercial uses and 550 residential units on six parcels of land. Now there's two land bays associated with the original rezoning. Land Bay 1, which is the residential portion, 
that consists of the 550 residential units. I would note that residential land bay, which is number one, is remaining the same. Land bay two is the commercial area, which we're talking about tonight. Now, I would note that this application was postponed at your December 12th meeting. If I can direct you to the screen on your left, the subject property is outlined in blue, and for reference, you have Route 50 along the frontage, Prince Frederick Drive, and Costello Drive. And the map now shows the existing zoning of the property. As you can see, that the lighter of the orange color is the R4, and the darker orange is existing adjacent B2. Now, rezoning of 3 of 18 seeks to sever two parcels of land from the original approved proffers and rezone them to the M1 district with a new and separate set of proffers. Now, the primary changes proposed with this rezoning include modifications to the overall transportation network approved with the overall Governor's Hill rezoning that were shared by both land bays 1 and 2. Now, this site is located within the limits of the Sensony Eastern Frederick Urban Area Plan of the 2035 Comprehensive Plan. That plan depicts the subject properties with a commercial land use designation. Now, that commercial designation is reflective of the existing commercial component of the approved mixed-use development approved for the site with the original rezoning. So, therefore, the requested M1 zoning is inconsistent with the Comprehensive Plan. Now, again, on the screen to your left, this is... Ex Excerpt from the comprehensive plan, as you can see, this yellow hatching is commercial adjacent to the residential performance or the residential section of Land Bay 1. Now, staff would note that this rezoning does not provide any coordination with Land Bay 1 or the remainder of Land Bay 2, which is not owned by the applicant. Also, staff would note that the original rezoning utilized commercial tax revenue generated from the commercial to offset the impacts of the 550 residential units in Land Bay 1. And staff would note that the applicant has not demonstrated that the proposed industrial square footage continues to adequately uh, offset the impacts from the residential. Now, so jumping into the proffers for the rezoning, they have proffered a mix of light industrial uses with a maximum of 3,100 trips per day. They've also, uh, for architectural standards, their new proffer states that similar architectural styles and signage in conformance with the zoning ordinance shall be provided. Now, with the original rezoning, they had what is called a design package that was approved with the rezoning. Now, that was a uniform package for the commercial and the residential that addressed um, things like street, streetscape design, landscaping, screening, and open space standards that were for the entire development. And they've now removed the architectural standards for the cohesive development and the architectural review board that would look at the entire development. So a, a brief summary of what I've discussed, the conformance with the 2035 comprehensive plan, the lack of coordination with Land Bay 2. It's unclear if the development will continue to offset the 550 residential units, the elimination of the design modification package, and the elimination of the coordinated and unified development with the entire project. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Bishop, and he's going to go over the transportation. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. <clears throat> uh, as Candace noted, a key component of uh, staff's consideration with this rezoning comes down to the comprehensive plan and, uh, and implementation thereof. So if I may begin first by showing you the Eastern Road Plan as it's depicted in the area of this rezoning. The rezoning is uh, highlighted in a, in a darker blue here. Now first, if I may, I'd bring your attention to Coverstone Drive itself, which goes through the development, which I'm just tracing along the road here to bring your attention to it. Um, key component of our comprehensive plan because it allows all these residential units an additional opportunity to avoid the intersections that are currently, frankly, overburdened in many cases along Route 50, particularly the intersection of Route 50 and 522 at I-81, but also intersections such as Prince Frederick Drive, which still does have its challenges. Second. I would point out the eventual 522 relocation. And hopefully by doing that, uh, you start to see how these items are supposed to come together long-term um, to allow for better traffic through this area. Once again, 
pulling focus away from that heavily burdened intersection that, that it impacts the I-81 interchange so directly. And finally, I would just point out, because it's on here, um, though it's not part of this rezoning, this is the access road back into the residential portion, which Candace had pointed out. This is the currently approved master plan, as you can see. Coverstone Drive is a key component. Of course, Taswell Drive back to the residential is there as well. Now what this graphic does is it takes that roadway and breaks it into the phase of your currently approved proffers. And as you can see, the red section is actually phase one of your currently approved proffers. Reason for that, once again, as I noted before, we're trying to draw those trips away from those other existing overburdened intersections as opposed to funnel more trips into them. <clears throat> and that was supposed to be the key primary access for any commercial trips, that, that any commercial development that would have exceeded 400,000 square feet, or I'm sorry, prior to the first commercial occupancy permit because there was a $300,000 office allowed to access via existing Coverstone Drive, or your first residential permit. So all of the land bays really hinge under your currently approved proffers on having that first section of roadway done. And while the colors don't show up, phases two and three are the remaining four lanes of this roadway. You'll see, it. like I said, it doesn't show up. There's one, two lanes are green and two lanes are blue. As they went over 400,000 square feet, they had to build two lanes. And as they exceeded 800,000 square feet of commercial, they had to build two more. And once again, that's under your currently approved proffers. As we move into what's being proposed now, it sort of takes that and turns it on its head a little bit. And we begin, instead of working in from Route 50, working into the property from the existing end of Coverstone Drive. And as you can see now, phase one is segment A to B. Segment A to B, under the currently proposed proffers, has to be constructed as a four-lane facility uh, with associated bike path. And that will allow them to build up to 405,000 square feet. Phase two takes you from B to C. Once again, with four lanes and a bike path. Also as part of phase two is C to D. Now initially C to D was part of a phase three that has been adjusted in your currently proposed proffers. And what will happen now under the currently proposed proffers should you approve them is at the same time that B to C is being constructed, C to D would be either constructed or bonded. And as you can see, that takes you to the boundary of what's known as the Hawkman track and eventually the continuation of Coverstone Drive. What it doesn't do is this, this this uh, land bay two is now no longer part of the remainder of Coverstone Drive. Now, if I can rewind a little bit, we are back into phase one because there are some offsite improvements as well and they are part of phase <coughs> one. Uh, the first of those is the extension of the existing left turn lane striping on Route 522 at Costello Drive. So all of you who are familiar with that uh, Owners drive to Costco on a Saturday, or if you ever make the mistake of trying to go there right after work, are familiar with how the, the cars track back up there already. The issue we have with this pr proposed improvement and the, frankly, the suggestion that it, that it offsets any additional capacity is that this area already fully gets filled with cars waiting to make that left turn. And as a matter of fact, it's actually very common to see cars all the way back in front of the United Bank. Um, I've, I've been there myself many times. Because what happens is as long as nobody's already in that, as you can see, that's already the opposing left turn lane. If nobody's already in it, and people want to be in that left to go to Costco, they already pull over there. That's very common. Whether you go at lunchtime or after work, that's a regular condition over there. Now you may be aware that we have a smart scale application pending to actually implement double lefts onto Costello at this location. Of course, as I'm preparing to go over with the transportation committee uh, in short order, that's actually currently not recommended uh, for funding. Um, now I'm very aware that, uh, that VDOT has 
for all intents and purposes, signed off on this TIA. However, VDOT was also intimately involved with scoping that additional project. So there's a, there's a bit of a problem, frankly, between <coughs> what the TIA is showing you in this location and what ground, ground truth real world experience is. If I can shift from there to the area just outside the core of engineer building, if you're looking for a landmark, this is the intersection of Costello Drive and Prince Frederick Drive. And what the applicant's proposing to do here is on the southbound side, coming from <coughs> Route 50 to 520, uh, toward, toward the Sheriff's Office, is to provide a right turn, dedicated right turn lane on the Costello Drive, and additionally adding a dedicated left turn lane on the northbound side as you're heading from this development to Route 50. Now that would require some additional right of way. We uh, requested but have not received an analysis of available right of way for these proposed offsite improvements uh, to see if we believe they can fit because there's a, another proffer which I'll get to in a moment regarding these offsite improvements. But that's, that's what you're looking at there and we do have concerns about the available right of way. And finally, if I can bring you, <clears throat> pardon me, to the intersection of Route 50 and, and uh, Prince Frederick Drive, uh, you can see, once again, a number of dedicated turn lanes that this applicant is proposing to do offsite. Once again, I'm not that sure about available right away. I'm, I, I'm pretty confident that the median right away is available, uh, and I actually feel pretty good about the right away that's in front of Tri State Nissan there along Route 50. I don't know about the right away along Prince Frederick, Frederick Drive. And once again, an analysis was requested, but we have not received that. Now, I would note that there is another proffer in this pre proposed rezoning package, which does state that if such right away is not available, either the applicant's unable to, to it's, there's not room, they're not able to buy it, and uh, the county's not gonna go get it for them, that they would prepare a cost estimate for review by VDOT and pay the county the value of that improvement. Of course, while it's always nice to receive money, the problem is uh, the county historically is not the benefit in the, in the business of condemning right away anyway. So we'll have the money, but we'll also still have uh, the impacts that are unlikely to get addressed. If I can quickly summarize, and I know I went through that fairly quickly, we'll definitely be available for questions as we get to the end of this. Um, key concern at the staff level is implement, implementation of the comprehensive plan road network. Um, a lot of people over a lot of years have put a lot of work into outlining that, and that is your currently adopted plan. Um, there is no indication at this point that there's any sort of an agreement reached between the applicant and the I'll refer to them as the, the former partners since this was all rezoned together, uh, that this is acceptable to anybody. And that makes staff very worried that perhaps it's not feasible that the remaining land base can come in and build the rest of that roadway down to Route 50. Um, based on all the interaction we've heard, we're, we're very worried about that. Um, as I noted, the shift to Coverstone implementation without some sort of an agreement really leaves the, the county a little bit in limbo. I'm somewhat concerned about the increased truck, uh, truck trip generation, um, not just because of where those trucks are going, but just more trucks in general, that's a, that's a lot higher impact than cars. Now I will not deny the fact that this rezoning on the whole ends up in much fewer overall trips than the original rezoning, cannot deny that but it's just as many and more trucks and we always look really hard at trucks and have to be very careful with those, those kind of impacts. I've already noted to the analysis of right of way needs for the offsite improvements as a concern for staff and I would reiterate again, particularly the inadequacy of the turn lane improvement at 522 in Costello. Um, you're, you're offering a stripe part of a condition that, that already exists. It's, 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 it's not gonna accomplish anything unfortunately. Um, with that, I'll take, I'll turn the rest of the summary uh, over to Mrs. Perkins. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. To summarize the uh, presentation, you have all the conclusions and issues identified, Mr. Bishop. There's a compliance with the comprehensive plan, coordination with Land Bay 2, the 
unclear about the impacts of the 550 residential units and whether or not it's being offset by this industrial rezoning. <clears throat> Elimination of the design modification package and the eliminated uh, elimination of the coordinated and unified development for the entire project. Now, the Planning Commission held a public hearing for this rezoning at their November 7th meeting. The Commission did express concerns regarding the transportation components, but they did ultimately recommend approval. So, again, this was postponed at your December 12th meeting, and tonight, following the public hearing, staff is seeking a decision on this rezoning. I'd be glad to answer your questions, as well as Mr. Bishop, and the applicant is also here. Thank you. Questions, Ms. Perkins? Anyone? Supervisor Law. Ms. Perkins, I've gotten several calls from people who live in the Ravens about buffers. Um, they like, as I think most of us do, to look over there and see that land in its natural state, which is understandable. And they're concerned about the the look of the or the face of that particular area once this goes in. Will what kind of buffers are going to be required along Route 50 if this rezoning is approved? Will there just be bare? Will you be able to see the buildings? Will they have berms? Will they have plantings? Right. Since it's an industrial rezoning, they don't have to do a residential separation buffer, which you typically see with residential along highways, so you would not see any landscaping. So it would be, depending on the grading that they do, you might see buildings. So there will be proper buffers in place? Yes, sir. There will not? No, sir. Okay. So you could be able to look up there and see the buildings? Possibly, yes, sir. Okay. And that's because of the particular zoning? Um, Correct. There's only... Number one. Right. There's only buffers if they directly adjoin property lines. But since it's... But, uh, but, but since it's highway... A, but since it's across the street. Okay. Right. Thank you. Would there... Yes, would there be... Some of that property is residential. If it did go residential, there'd be a... A buffer between the re between re residential land, and the between light. land base one and two. Yes. Yes, there would be a between resident. Between the yes. light and dust. Between yeah, between the project. Yes. As uh, 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 Mr. Lofton was saying, down at the highway, I think was where you were talking. Right. It wouldn't be there. Correct. Okay. Right. Other questions, Ms. Perkins? Anyone? But, but Ms. Perkins, done. If the current zoning were there, which I believe is B two, there also would there be any type of a buffer if it were B two? No, sir. Okay, so there'd be actually no difference. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions, Ms. Perkins? Anyone? Supervisor Slaughter. I'm not sure if this is for Mrs. Perkins or Mr. Bishop, but Mr. Bishop had referenced not receiving um, right away information back. It, where is the right away information coming? Is it from VDOT or? Frankly, the onus of that analysis would be on the applicant. They would look at the deeded right-of-ways uh, within the uh, context of the improvements they're suggesting and see if they fit. Very well. Thank you, sir. Other questions for either Mr. Bishop or Ms. Perkins? Which one? For Mr. Bishop, um, the diagram you showed up there. Yes, sir. The original entrance to the commercial and residential areas under the original rezoning? Yes, sir. That one. One red there. So the, the, the strip in red is the initial build of Coverstone Drive. That's your phase which one, was yes, meant sir. To serve as the main entrance to the commercial area and to the residential area. Yes, sir. Uh, do we know about how many trips that was going to generate? I'm sorry, I, I, I don't actually recall that. Well, that's okay, because I just happened to think of it as, as I was looking up there, so I would have alerted you before if I'd have known. Uh, but those potential trips go away now, right? We, if this is rezoned right now, with this rezoning, with the extension of the roadway... Well, in terms that of that has location, to, to a certain extent they do, although that proffer still exists on the other land base. Okay. But I, I guess what uh, the point I'm trying to make is... If this rezoning is approved with the proposed roadway network as planned, there is no impact at that point on Route 50. There can't be any traffic here because there's not going to be a well, road there. won't there. be an entrance and there. With so this rezoning, until such time as there is an entrance, no, you wouldn't have any impact at that location. Yeah. We, we, if someone gets the other land base addressed <coughs> to build, then they would have to build this particular yes. section of and that would impact it, okay. Um, that's one thing. And as you said, the 
truck traffic is capped at 31, which is a decrease in the trip generation? It's definitely a decrease, a significant decrease in the trip generation. I would actually clarify that 3,100 is a total trips, not just tractor trailers. Okay, total traffic. Very good. Question. Um, okay, that's all I have right now. Thank you. Okay. Well, well. And, and question, uh, follow up on Mr. Lofton. <clears throat> in the where the original proffer was in red, mm -hmm. Prince Frederick will now become the exit to Route 50, Costello Drive becomes the exit to Route 522. Those Com are, yeah, those combination, are the two I would, I would actually, exit. That's, that's exactly right. That right. right. If, if you're headed for, for 522, I expect you're gonna go to Costello. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to head for the interchange at exit 313, you're probably gonna pick your poison. It could be either one, frankly, but yeah. So um, we're just diverting Entrances. There is, an, uh, there is an access egress on Route 50 at the present time, but it's there, and as you said, that's pretty heavily traveled at this time yes, also. Sir. When I talked to you today, it was my understanding that you felt pretty strongly in the, that by having the proffered access, if we could get that, that would be a help in transportation, that's where I'm concerned about transportation. I believe I, it will. I, 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 the, the, as far as the rezoning and the types of things that are taking place, I'm okay. I, I just, for Frederick County, I'm concerned about transportation. I know the people in Raven Wing and Ravenwood, they've called me also. And, but that's going to be a situation that we're dealing with no matter what we do, it's across the street. And yes, sir. when this does develop, that's that's there. There's nothing we can really control on that other than try to give some accesses that do some things. If we ever got the 522 movement up there, it would certainly help alleviate the problem. But I, I, I doubt that that's seriously going to happen anytime <coughs> real soon. Cer certainly our comprehensive plan is long-term in nature, but uh, as you see those puzzle pieces coming together, uh, you can you can see the reason behind them and, and how they help us as a whole. Okay. Um, and, and I know that in this proper statement, as we're seeing it right now, we're seeing just exactly the way that is, that that will we'll start at the green road and move up. Um, and if that did develop, if the other two pieces of land did develop, it it would be, there would be an accessible at the at kind of at the U-turn there for those people to use on the road that's being developed if, if there was no access on Route 50. Well, right, right here. Their land base based on their right existing there. proffers because the original proffers will still carry with those other land base. So they are still in a situation where they can't get one residential right. okay. permit right. without that, that that's right. access okay. existing. Okay. okay. All right. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll hold, I'll get some other things, but it'll come later. Yes, sir. Other questions for Mr. Bishop? Uh, Anyone? Supervisor Dunn? Mr. Bishop, I just want to reiterate, you're essentially restriping the Costello and the Route 50, yes, but you're sir. not adding capacity, That's correct? correct? My second question or concern is that under the current proffers, <clears throat> I believe where you have red, it's meant to be two lanes coming in and two lanes going out. Yes, sir. If this were rezoned to M1, could those two lanes become, four lanes, become two lanes just to deal with the traffic if it were done all the way from Route 50 up to the proposed um, finish near the public safety building? Could that be redone to be just two lanes, for example, for trucks? Which would then put all the traffic basically onto Route 50, which addresses Mr. Wells' ish concerns, and I concur with those concerns, on having traffic going out on Prince Frederick and on Costello. Does that help to solve the county's problem? There's, there's any, yes. Uh, there's any number of ways you could phase it, frankly, over time, because obviously the early phases of the development don't require four lanes. That's a lot of trips. Um, it just, this, this was the phasing that was presented to the county at this rezoning. The, the key concern at that time was being able to get that traffic uh, out onto 50 and gone as soon as possible. So if 
this applicant were to be working with the other property owners and there was some sort of uh, agreement, if you will, that maybe altered phasing, um, there's, there's any number of ways it could still, still work and be so viable. That, so that road could be reconsidered with a different configuration, correct? In other words, it could be simply a two-lane road to deal with truck traffic, which would put most of that truck traffic onto Route 50, and then it eliminates the, the potential congestions on 522 and Costello, as well as the tra truck traffic that would be down Prince Frederick. Yes, sir, up to a certain level of development. Two okay, lanes would serve you for a good long time. Thank you. Roger Lofton. To beat this dead horse, transportation. <laughs> um, some of the other concerns I've heard from the Ravens is traffic generated by the, if this rezoning is approved. I understand it, it's gonna be mostly industrial traffic, uh, mostly truck traffic, and that traffic I'm thinking would not generally go through the Ravens at all. In fact, I think some of it would be prohibited from going through that uh, roadway network. Yeah, I don't, particularly a truck trip, I mean, who knows where employees are gonna live and, and, and all that sort of thing, but particularly a truck trip, you're talking over the road truck drivers, um, whereas that, I know that area is known as a cut through, everybody knows that, but in terms of actual trucks using that as a cut through and based on the long distances that you're usually looking at warehouse distribution centers, I, I don't find that likely. It's certainly, for example, if you're trying to get to Route 7 on a tractor trailer, that's certainly still not convenient. I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze on that, uh, on that trip. It seems to me that the origin destination of the traffic for this use, if it's approved, is going to be generated from the intersection of 81, 50, 522. Yeah, I think if they're not trying to take 50 to get into the metro area, if you will, that they're trying to get to the interstate or 522, I'd agree with that. Okay, thank you. Other questions of Mr. Bishop, anyone? Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Other questions from Ms. Perkins, are there any? Thank you. Applicants? <coughs> First of all, thank, thank you, uh, everyone, for taking the time. I appreciate it. I know we've had a number of meetings, and the uh, discourse has been very uh, polite and thoughtful, which it isn't always in this business or some other businesses, so I appreciate that. Um, I, I just wanted to speak a bit about the, the business case, um, which I know is, is one of the considerations of the county, not, not the main one, and then Ty will and the rest of my team will also um, add uh, some, some thoughts. So this, the, the proposed rezoning will benefit the county by providing new jobs, roads, and revenues. When fully built out, the development will generate more than half a million dollars a year in tax revenues alone without additional school impacts and while maintaining a traffic trip count that is far more than what exists under the current zoning. If the zoning is approved tonight, Hines would construct, commence construction imminently without a tenant. We would develop spec, assuming both leasing and construction risk, and deliver our signature high quality improvements to long dormant par parcels. And as you can see from the slide here, it's a little bit difficult to read, but Hines has developed over 270 million square feet throughout the US and abroad since its founding in the 1950s. The firm has set itself apart from other major developers through its continued close family ownership, its reputation for integrity, best in class design and building standards and its ability to execute on and complete complex projects. Given the firm's sterling track record and considerable capital, time and resources already invested throughout the last year and, year and a half to advance pre-development activities, investor outreach, and the entitlement process, the county would not find a development partner better suited for this project. I appreciate that there's a long history of proposed development at the various Governor's Hill properties, most of it predating Heinz's involvement. 
And I understand the county's desire for a coordinated approach with respect to future development. We will continue to support and reinforce this approach, but the reality is that a history of defaults has resulted in gridlocked and divided ownership, and Heinz cannot act on behalf of the properties that it does not own or contract with. And while we believe rezoning will drive future development, a massive upfront amalgamation effort by Heinz will not pass internal approval. Finally, I would reiterate that while, while we further recognize and encourage recent interest in rezoning for airport support uses, among other Governor's, Hills, Governor's Hill parcels, Heinz has been the only group that has actually taken action to move this process forward, investing significant capital and resources over the past year and a half to advance the project. <coughs> Any further delays would require internal and external approvals from our investment partners that are anything but guaranteed. Furthermore, Heinz has even agreed to assume a cash transportation payment from the existing Governor's Hill proffer that is passed due by the current landowners. In summary, I recognize that the, this rezoning is not a panacea for the county, but in considering approval tonight, I would ask each of you whether you believe this rezoning, the first of its kind proposed in over a decade, will on net provide a clearer benefit to the county and whether Heinz is the best firm to actually see development through and uphold any approved agreements with the county. Thank you, and I, I, I'll let Ty speak, and then I, I'm also happy to answer uh, any, any questions after that point. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, for the record, I'm Ty Lawson uh, here on behalf of Heinz. David Frank is also here on behalf of Pannoni if, if we have uh, uh, engineering questions or things of that sort. We were here last month tabled uh, to allow the underlying property owners to meet and talk. Um, our original intent was just to appear and, and report that that had occurred. We, we are not a property owner yet, we're a contract purchaser. Um, so we did not participate in that meeting. Um, we've seen some letters recently. Um, I think you all have. Uh, probably says a lot more than what we intended to report was, again, just that, that they had met as, as you all have requested. Um, the letters confirm that meeting. And just to summarize it, it, it if there's a positive in that, that correspondence back and forth, it does appear that there's a recognition by all parties, including our, our, our neighbors to the east, and a desire apparently for them to, to file uh, a rezoning of their own to M1. So uh, we're hearing uh, from, from multiple places and sources and including meetings with many of you all that M1 is, is a, a, a desirable use uh, for this property and, and that is what we're looking uh, to accomplish with the rezoning. The other thing that's, that's important to point out and and uh, Ron Mislowski from Pannoni did a great job talking about the history of this property. And I'm not going to go through all of it. Uh, you can look on your proffer statement. I think we go back to, to 08 in the, uh, in the chronology of all the various iterations and refilings. It actually goes back longer than that. It's 15 years plus. Um, and this was rezoned in, in, in mass. There were separate tracks. There was one property owner, and that was uh, Miller and Smith. Um, there was a, a discussion about uh, roads. Mr. Bishop did a great job talking about that. Mr. Mislowski pointed out actually the history of these various roads. And if you want to go back to the original iteration of this, the connection uh, was not running through the Ravens. Uh, the Coverstone connection was actually going to Sulphur Spring. And the property owner at that point took a look at that. And we don't know uh, the specifics, but we were told it's just it's not buildable, it's not desirable. Um, heard from a former supervisor that perhaps there may have been some safety issues connecting with Sulphur Springs with the hill and so on. And then the road was moved uh, to Coverstone where it would connect with Raven Wing. And I was actually interested to learn when I, when I heard the presentation, that was 522. 
Uh, this prior board actually voted that, that 522 would connect somewhere, I, I'm assuming it's, it's where the northern Y of, of the Russell 150 was to be, um, and, and where the Elks, I think it's the Elks driveway is, and then come across the airport property, wiggle over, come through this property, and then go across 50. And uh, I was reminded that that didn't happen, and the reason is there's a farm in the way, um, and, and the owners do not want 522 running across their property. So subsequently, 522 was moved again by, by this body, and it is west of our property. It's, it's off our property. And that it was interesting for us, because we're part of what we were trying to understand is why, why this boulevard, why this divided highway road, and that was quite a bit of it. The other, of course, and you can read the rezonings that were filed previously, was to accommodate what you have before you right now, which is not only the 550 residential units, multi and town, but over, I think it's 1.2 million square feet of retail, commercial which was to generate, and I've forgotten who asked the question, why the roads, why are they so big? 45,000 plus trips per day. And yes, cars, yes, trucks. Um, that helps explain why the road networks and, and, and why this thing was, was to run a, uh, across our property. Of course, a lot happened over 15 years. There were several uh, refilings, the original ones by the, the property owner that had the property, Miller and Smith. Uh, Miller and Smith, uh, reasons known only to them, let two of the parcels go. They had seller financing, they stopped paying, they went into default, those were foreclosed on, and that's how you end up with the rectangular piece, which is Hockman, and of course the, uh, the piece that Heinz has under contract, the, the piece that's owned by the Russells and, and the Dicks. Um, there have been, and there was staff used the interesting word to me, that this is a severing through this, through this proffer amendment and rezoning, but actually this, this body has voted on not only these several uh, iterations and changes that affected one parcel or another, uh, I believe it's 2013 and 2014, there were actually two proffer amendments, which are rezonings, that just related to the property that's before you today. Um, one had to do with changing dates for when certain proffered things were to occur, roads and pavements and things of that sort. Alex pointed out there's still a legacy, apparently, of a $20,000 payment that was to be paid collectively, and in our our proffer, we're just taking that on as our burden and we're gonna pay it. Um, the other was actually to increase the square footage that was allowed of a commercial nature on the, the uh, Russells and Dick property. And if I'm reading between the lines, I think it was to allow for a very large government structure. And I believe at that point in time, again, this was in the 13, 14 time period, somebody was thinking about putting the FBI building on the property and to have it use the existing cover stone only and then go out through the road network that, that we are proposing to, to actually amplify and, and add on to. Um, but when this board voted before to allow for the FBI building to just use Coverstone and go out using the existing road network without those improvements, um, I would suggest that to the extent we're going to use the word sever, there is precedent and this body has voted and approved these, these revisions and that was a significant one that related only to this property and not the other property uh, before. Also, Mr. Mislowski pointed out, and it was, it was quite something, that apparently that FBI building comes with approximately 6,000 trips a day and that's what was allowed and actually, that's as the proffers sit today, that's what's allowed. That is not what we're doing. Uh, Mr. Bishop properly said we are agreeing to a hard stop, all vehicle trips at 3,100. And briefly to the question about could there be other scenarios, uh, I've forgotten, I believe it's Mr. Dunn, 
other routes and things of that sort. Actually, we've built that into the proffer. What we are saying is we will do no more than 3,100 trips. If the, if the studies for future development say you're going to have more, then we have to go back to the process. We have to go back to you all. We have to go back to VDOT. And it, uh, we're not smart enough to know what the future will be, but whatever road needs to be uh, added on to or new roads built and, and that sort of thing, that's why we put that uh, into the proffers. Um, just briefly to the to the staff comments, uh, there's language about the uh, the, the comprehensive plan. Um, we've highlighted some sections. Probably the easiest and, and biggest thing to read is airport support area. The comp plan was amended after this body rezoned this property to this this combination thing of a million two of, of retail, which by the way is, it's, it's a mall, it's Apple Blossom, it's bigger than Apple Blossom Mall, that's what was contemplated. And then the 550 residential units, the comp plan was amended because it had to be. It had to address the fact that the board, despite the fact that the text for this area says that it's an airport support area, it had to carve out and say, and there's gonna be this use that was just approved by the Board of Supervisors. But we're really pleased, and frankly, we think it's appropriate, that if you read your comp plan as it's written today, this is an airport support area, which calls for business and industrial uses. And it's an airport support district, and logically, because it's adjacent to the airport. In fact, a portion of our property actually abuts up to the airport property in it, and it's right next to where the airport is slated to put in new hangars where you can drive in and fly out and, and have uh, industry that would, that would want to be and use uh, the, the airport as, as part of its business. Uh, the bottom line is, and I think the words speak for themselves, we, we are frankly most definitely in compliance with your comp plan and respectfully would submit that M1 is, is frankly more compliant with an airport support area than, than the current zoning of, of residential and, uh, and commercial. There's also uh, a discussion about cooperation among the parties um, to the rezoning. And we've, we've enjoyed and, and appreciated the comments about how there, there must be an agreement or there must be some tie uh, in, in the various properties. But actually, if, if you read the proffers, it's very specific as to which use and which property triggers which improvement and specifically road improvements. I, I think Mr. Bishop pointed out that properly, that if the residential is built, for example, they need to build that, that connection to Route 50. It's, it's very specific. If the property that we have under contract is built uh, to a certain size, and again, uh, as a result of your, your vote, you could build that, that FBI complex and still use Coverstone and it's only after you exceed a certain number of trips then you need to, uh, to build the rest of the uh, of the other of the other road network. Um, there is also a discussion about possibly there was some sort of a of an offset or an offset of impacts in the original zoning or the zoning that you have before you, and. Uh, the bottom line is it, it does not exist. It is not in your proffers. Um, I understand the concept. I participated in many rezonings where uh, that has been not only talked about, but most importantly, it has been reduced to writing. It has been put into the proffers and certain uh, development, i.e. residential development, cannot be built until a certain amount of square footage of, of uh, non uh, or of tax generating uh, product like commercial, like industrial, things that don't generate school kids uh, has to not only be built and delivered, 
before you can do other things. Russell 150, for example, requires 100,000 feet of commercial before any residential can be built. Going way, way back, uh, Cross Point requires, I believe it's, it's, it's approaching 200,000 square feet of commercial before any residential component can be done. Um, I, I, I recall it was Carriage Hill or Long Valley Mill. I think that's been done a couple of times. And there, there are certain ties to that. So we, we all are very familiar with that, but it's not here. Um, so uh, to suggest that, that there are conditions that tie one property to another, um, uh, it's just, it, it is not evident, it is not in the, in the uh, proffers. So uh, as we say, there's no proffer that requires any cost sharing on any infrastructure improvement. In fact, it's, it's very clear, if you do this, then you've got to build this. If you exceed this, then you've got to do that. And it's, it's actually very well done and, and segmented. There's, there's no proffer that requires commercial development. Um, and actually, as you sit here today, there is no proffer that requires that offset or any commercial development. Either side can, can do what they want with their property. Would suggest that 15 years of no activity uh, speaks volumes, especially since we've enjoyed a robust econ economy in these last few years. I, I don't think, frankly, that the residential is especially desirable, nor will it be built. And likewise, unfortunately, there's just not a market or an appetite for, for commercial and, and certainly not that size. Um, each, each land bay is required to construct uh, Coverstone Drive as needed to support its own development. So actually, there's overlap, and so there's multiple triggers to create some of these improvements. So when this was written, it was written, uh, it was written well to catch different scenarios because nobody knew, I guess, what the future would bring. But one way or the other, these, these things uh, would presumably occur if this was to be built out as a residential and the million plus feet of, of commercial uh, development. Um, talking about the uh, transportation impacts, again, the, the current proffer allows for the development of 300,000 square feet of office with access only from the existing and installed Coverstone Drive. That's where we sit today. Our proffer is, of course, different. We did, however, tie uh, to the tra traffic trips that would be generated by the 300,000 feet. So it's very intentional that we put the 3,100 trips as a, as a cap. That is what the manual says that 300,000 square feet of office would, would generate. I would point out, and Ms. Lowski pointed this out before, with the other amendment that you all allowed, proffer amendment, that, that actually could have jumped to 6,777 trips per day if, if that government facility had, in fact, uh, been delivered there. Um, the, the extension of Coverstone Drive from its current point uh, at the Public Safety <laughs> Building to Millwood Pike was required to support 1.2 million square feet of retail that was, of course, the 45,000 trips. With this rezoning, that goes away. We're not going to generate 45,000 trips. We are capping ourselves at, at the uh, uh, 3,100. Um, we do uh, proffer uh, the off site um, improvements. Um, appreciate the discussion about the, the design of these improvements and that sort of thing. Uh, and Pannoni is here, and they can they can speak more to that. But what what we have been advised is the way that works is there is a design, and then it's and then it's laid to the ground. There there are right of ways that were dedicated there. Uh, that's a relatively modern this uh, uh, layout. This is not a a bird act road system that we're going to tie into. So the minimum is, is a 50-foot right-of-way. And if you look on GIS, there, there are other larger right-of-ways as they approach uh, Route 50 and, and the like. Um, but 
but it, it is, has been explained to me that um, before you, you, you go forward with this, and we have proffered that we would do these improvements, also proffered that we'll pay for these improvements um, as, as a condition of, of, of doing this work. Um, but with regard to the right-of-way, again, once it's designed, we, we believe it's, it'll fit in there. And this is something that, that has been uh, vetted not only by engineering studies, traffic studies, but then, of course, meetings with, with VDOT and, and not only recommendations, but their approval. And, and VDOT's a tough grader in, in this day and age. And, and for them to say these are the improvements you need to do, and, and uh, we, we believe that, that, this is, that this is accurate. Um, already talked about that if we, if we get to a, a plan or a study that, that says we're going to exceed the 3,100, it's a full stop. We have to resubmit, go through the process, and build uh, to your satisfaction and VDOT's satisfaction whatever road network would be required uh, uh, to serve this. Um, there's, there's discussions about um, it's unfair or things of that sort to develop this. Um, while the other properties are, are, are where they are, um, again, we're, we're trying to comply with the airport support district. We're trying to give a use that generates tax revenue now uh, that does not uh, demand services, uh, does not generate school kids and, and that sort of thing, provides for employment opportunities. Um, and we submit that this, this is a very positive uh, rezoning for the county and would look forward to, uh, to, to your questions and comments. One thing I do want to point out, um, under the proffers that you have before you, there is a reference at 7-1 about bonding the segment from C to D, and there's also triggers that, that would require us to build that if somebody else on the other side builds a road so that they're not building a road to nowhere. Um, we did receive some comments on that and some frustration with bonding and, and what that bond looks like years in the future. Um, we, we, for the purposes of the record, and I believe we can proffer items that are more restrictive on us, we're deleting the bonding or in that, in that uh, section, and so it will read uh, that we will construct uh, the four-lane section from point C to D as, as part of that second phase. Um, so we're taking the bonding out of the picture. The road, the road will just be built to the property line. And the other condition is still there. If someone else builds more quickly, we have to connect so that when they're open, we're open. We cannot hold them up. We will not hold them up. We have proffered that. So I did want to point that out, that the, uh, the bond uh, piece is, uh, has been eliminated. I hope that picked up a lot of the questions, but we're here to respond to your, your questions. Not yet. Not somebody, yet. Somebody else wanted to come back. So which order do you all want to do that in? Who would you like to come back? Uh, it's up to you all. Do you have other folks that want to speak before we oh, go to I'm questions? Sorry. No, that's that's our presentation. Questions Thank Mr. you. Mr. Lawson, anyone? Supervisor Wells. Mr. Lawson. <coughs> yes, sir. As, as uh, I'm assuming that you're in the role as attorney for the Hine Group. Yes, sir. And you speak solely for them? I do not speak for the property owners, if that's your question. Right. The, the presentation you gave, am I to assume that that is where the Hind group is on, on all those things that you talked about yes what i spoke to were the you spoke to on to the re, to the proposed rezoning you spoke the, a long time <laughs> a long time and i listened i apologize i should have apologized no in that's okay. okay i understand but i just need to clarify that what i heard you say is what is written in stone, and that's where we are. Yes, sir. I, I spoke from the Thank proffers that we have that's filed. Fine. That's all I need to hear. Thank you. Thank you. 
Other questions, Mr. Lawson, anyone? Supervisor Lofton. Mr. Lawson, um, I hate to spring it on you and the applicant at this point, but like I say, uh, I was getting phone calls late this afternoon. Uh, didn't have time to contact you to ask the owner. And what I'm, is buffers, and that's why I asked Ms. Perkins that question. Do um, you believe the applicant would be amenable to planting a, a living buffer along that Route 50 um, portion of your property uh, to address some of the concern about the, the buffers and looking in at that industrial section? Uh, I, that's I, one thing. Uh, the second is that uh, I do appreciate your fact, and I was one that brought up the bonding because uh, we have been caught before with bonds that at some, and I don't like future contracts, um, bonds that we have set aside to finish a, a roadway. Uh, sometime in the future, we find out that that bond doesn't cover it. And so I appreciate that applicant agreeing to just go ahead and build in that second phase. So um, that's all I have right now. Mr. Chairman, do you want me to respond to the buffer? You may. Thank you. One of even you better, even better. So we, we, we are, we can commit to, to providing a buffer. And in fact, I think that's sort of the interest are in line because we want to build something that is marketable and looks, looks nice. Uh, so we, we are amenable to doing that. Thank you. Anyone? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Minor, <clears throat> my understanding is that in order to make an amended proffer, it has to come from the landowner themselves, not from the contract owner of the property, and I, I have yet to hear that, that there's any agreement on that. So before we make any decisions tonight, I'd like to know for sure that the landowners are making that amended proffer. The, um, it's a great point. Um, and although it is, un, in, 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 from what I've seen, it is somewhat unusual to, to modify your proffers. At, at the hearing stage, the law allows uh, a party to, to do that if it is more restrictive, I'll defer to county attorney, more restrictive on the, on the property owner. That's yeah. not the issue, is that um, we do not have anybody speaking tonight who has authority on behalf of the landowner. Okay, and, and we, are, we are a contract purchaser and uh, contingent on a rezoning. We're, at that point, we're, we are required and will requ uh, acquire the property. But have no problem and appreciate the point of submitting uh, signed proffers with edits that are requested as recently as a few seconds ago. And we do have uh, representatives of the landowners. It's a little unorthodox, but if, if we want, we can ask them to address it. I don't think unless every single one of them is here that the board is in a position to accept that. I think the proper process at this point would be for them to come back with a si fully signed proffer statement. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different proffer or different property owners. Again, we speak as the contract purchaser. We are obliged and will purchase the property if it's rezoned. But I understand your point. Other questions of Mr. Lawson? Anyone? Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, this is a public hearing. Would anyone like to comment concerning this proposed rezoning? Anyone at all? Anyone? You could have your name, magisterial district, or who you represent, and limit your comments to three minutes or less, please. Mr. Chairman. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Benjamin Lay. I'm an attorney and I represent Governors Hill, LLC. Steve Ayler is in the uh, audience with me from Miller and Smith, which is uh, part of Governors Hill. We ask that you vote to deny this application here tonight, uh, submitted by Hines. We do not make this suggestion lightly. The board may be disappointed that no one has made its choice easier tonight. We agree. But Governor's Hill is not the applicant. Governor's Hill does not suggest that the county reconfigure a key part of a three-party plan this board put in place with the original rezoning. 
We are open to revisiting the overall development plan for this site, but it must be done in a comprehensive fashion. And the opposite of comprehensive is piecemeal. And that term has special meaning in Virginia law when it comes to zoning actions. The Hines applications, uh, the application invites the board to accept a piecemeal or spot zone change that's materially at odds with the remaining parts of the original zoning. Instead of resolving anything, it complicates a lot. The best course for this board is to follow its own staff recommendations, noting that the applicant has not resolved some of these outstanding issues. What happens to the proffers from the original rezoning? What is the effect on the monetary cost to Hockman Investments and to Governor's Hill in the aftermath? What is the economic effect of potentially voiding the original proffer package? Those loose ends are a reason you should not approve this application tonight. No one wants to read these proffers tonight. No one wants to put themselves to sleep, but they are important. They have legal import. But I don't think there's anything unclear about a single sentence in that proffer that this is to be one single and unified development. Lawyers can try to make anything confusing. That's not confusing. <clears throat> I think there are side theaters between the parties that they are trying to work out, but Hines has elected not to be part of that discussion. Governor's Hill instead suggests that the board use this opportunity to hit the reset button, deny this application. I think the parties can work on a comprehensive proposal between JGR3, Hockman, and Governor's Hill. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you for your consideration, and we hope a better plan, a comprehensive plan, and not a piecemeal one, would come before you in the near future. Thank you, sir. Anyone else like to comment concerning this proposed rezoning? Anyone? Last call? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing portion. How would the board like to handle this one? Mr. Sorry Chairman. Trout, I would like to move to postpone this application, our, our vote on this application for 90 days based on what Mr. Williams just said to us in the board. Heard the motion, proposal to Okay. Postpone for 90 days. Is there a second? I'll second it. And a second. Discussion. Mr. Chairman. Those are done. May we speak to the merits of what was said or, or, or not? Sorry, the motion. Comments to the motion to postpone. Can I make any comments on what was publicly said by some of the participants or not? Is that not appropriate? To the motion, please, sir. Okay. I'll give you another chance. Okay, that's fine. Supervisor Lofton. Mr. Chairman, to the motion, uh, I would disagree with the motion. The parties have had um, maybe 45 days to get this worked out. I see no movement to get this agreement um, brought to an amenable conclusion. I see that the different opinions here from the parties uh, and we are on, as I understand it, um, fairly new legal ground here. I don't know the, how long and how well this has been addressed. I haven't seen that. Um, I don't know that another 90 days, 190 days is going to resolve anything. Uh, I think probably to me, um, sometimes action begets action, delay begets delay. So I would be voting against any more delay on this. I think we need to make a decision as to how we're gonna do it. I truly feel that this is the right thing to do and so I am against any more delay. Other discussion? Anyone? All right, the motion and the second is to postpone for 90 days. Supervisor Trout? Aye. Supervisor Dunn? Aye. Supervisor Lofton? No. Supervisor Wells? Aye. 
Supervisor Slaughter? Aye. Supervisor McCarthy? Aye. Chair votes no. But a motion carries. This decision is postponed for 90 days. All right. Moving forward, we have a request of Wesley Housing Resolution of Housing, Local Housing uh, Revitalization Area. Staff commenting or not? Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to make a comment. Uh, what you have in front of you is a revised resolution and letter provided by Mr. John Foote on behalf of Wesley Housing in St. Paul's upon the Hill. As you'll note in there through his correspondence, they've tried to address some of the comments that were received by the Board of Supervisors at the last meeting, and specifically the portion of the resolution uh, that deals with the comments or the um, dilapidated state, if you will, um, that uh, was of concern to the Board at that moment. So again, we had a revised letter of correspondence from Mr. Foote and a revised resolution as part of your agenda packet for the Board's consideration this evening. Questions or comments, anyone? Supervisor Dunn? Mr. Chairman, um, let me just check with you guys. Is there anybody here from St. Paul's today? Okay. I had a request from St. Paul's to postpone this for two weeks. Um, when you take a look at the law, I have concerns upon their request based upon what they're trying to do. So we have already approved the change in zoning to allow this to occur. That was what this board did. This board thinks that this sensitive place is a good situation for low-income housing, so we've approved that and believe that's a positive. There was no discussion on the tax credits other than tax credits would be used to achieve a result, and that information came to us less than a month ago. And the part of the code that they're requiring for those tax credits says that there's either a blighted area or it has to deal with certain economic conditions, which I don't believe are being met. So I have a hard time with that right now, and I'm going to ask for a postponement. To the other board members here, if this is in your magisterial district, or Mr. Chairman, if it were any place in the county, my comment to you is, based upon what you've seen, if you think other than the way I think, that's perfectly fine. I do not take offense at it. Um, I just went through A and B and don't find that it meets the criteria to go forward based upon what the General Assembly has said. I think that the General Assembly needs to revise the law that simply says something to the effect of if a county thinks something is appropriate, then it can be awarded the 15 points for tax credits. But to tie it to what they did doesn't work, in my opinion. So that's my concern. But if any of you disagree with that, please feel free. I don't want to be the person that prohibits this if you, in your opinion, think otherwise. So, Mr. Chairman, my, my, my comment will be to postpone this for two weeks. Is that a comment or a motion? I'll make that as a motion. Motion is there a second? It was a motion to postpone. It was? Two weeks. At the request of? Next meeting. The correct? Applicant. Yes. That was your intent? Yes, sir. Second. Motion to postpone to the next meeting. And a second? And a second. Now discussion. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Unless the legislature is going to convene within the next two weeks to change the law, I don't see what's going to change between now and two weeks from now because I think the law is pretty clearly written. Um, there's a two-part test to determine whether or not the county has the right to declare something a revitalization zone. Um, I think it's clear that the uh, applicant, however good the project is, um, in theory and in practice, they don't meet, in my opinion, that first part of that two-pronged test. So unless the legislature is meeting sometime between now and then, I don't know what, what it will change in the law that would, you know, help by postponing that discussion. Mr. McCarthy, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Mr. McCarthy, the applicant made the request. And if I were in their shoes, I would do the same. So I'm asking on behalf of my constituents 
at their request to do so. I understand that this likely will not be a change in the, in the law in the General Assembly, but they made the request to me. I've had a good discussion with them. So uh, from my perspective, I'll honor their request. Further discussion, Supervisor Lofton. Mr. Chairman, um, the reason I seconded Supervisor Dunn's request is, as he said, he's getting requests from his citizens. I have no problem postponing it. I will, I will vote against this resolution, even after the postponement, because I feel disingenuous saying that we need a local housing revitalization zone uh, for this particular project, when in fact, I don't believe it is. I don't believe we do. And if they had this in mind, when they first proposed this, I wish we had known about that. Um, I don't, as we, as we saw the last rezoning request that talked about piecemeal, I think this has been piecemeal. I'm a for affordable housing, but I don't like the way this is presented, and I certainly do not think that I could support a resolution saying that we had a local housing revitalization zone. Thank you, sir. Any further discussion, anyone? Motion is to postpone until our next meeting. Supervisor McCarthy. Aye. Supervisor Slaughter. Aye. Supervisor Wells. Aye. Supervisor Lofton. Aye. Supervisor Dunn. Aye. Supervisor Trout. Aye. Chair votes aye and the motion carries. We'll postpone this until our next meeting. This brings us to board liaison reports. Are there any? All right. Citizen comments on any issue. Does anyone have anything at all they'd like to share with the board? Anyone? No one? Board of Supervisors comments, are there any? Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Dunn. Today we had a ribbon cutting ceremony at Frederick Heights Park. I'd like to thank the Parks and Rec Commission for their support on this. I'd like to thank Walt Cunningham for bringing this to my attention. It's a citizen who brought it to a supervisor and said, here's a problem, can we address it? So we did. I'd like to thank my fellow supervisors for their vote on this. I really appreciate your help. This is gonna be a park where you can go and if you're a parent, take kids in a stroller and be safe. It's a place where you can go and run or walk. It's a good utilization of an existing 10 acre park which was totally not able to be used two years ago. I also would like to thank Mr. Kennedy from the Chamber of Commerce who came, presented us with a plaque and made the comment as a businessman representing that chamber that he would like to continue to work with the board. We appreciate his outreach. Thank you. So for all of those of you in Redbud and Frederick County, if you want a place to go to be safe, come to Frederick Heights Park. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Comments on any issue? Vice Chairman Lofton. Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn. Motion to adjourn is there a second? Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank everyone for their time and attention. We'll stand adjourned.